Um, first of all, I want to take this opportunity and thank all of you for supporting this uh, amazing event today because by supporting this event, you are supporting Pike State Library District. And uh, we can't do what we do every day without all your support. So thank you very much. And I know today is where there is an award for a very special individual that I heard the very first time about this amazing lady in 2007. And in 2007, I was not only new to Colorado Springs, but I was new to this country. So my very dear friend shared a wonderful story about Miss Peggy Shivers. And she shared with me how much of a difference this amazing individual made in our community. At the time, I was a part-time ESL instructor. And in my head, I was th thinking, maybe one day I will have an opportunity to meet her. It happened. I was introduced to her. Of course, she impressed me then. But then, going back to the, to, I believe it was 2016, as many of you know, Pikes Peak Library District has a very good partnership with USCIS when it comes to ho hosting naturalization ceremonies. And that ceremony, that day, is so important to every immigrant who finally achieves that accomplishment. Some of them that they, it takes them years to get there and to be called an American citizen. And that time I was uh, working in adult education at Pikes Peak Library District. And my responsibility was to organize that ceremony. And I was thinking, this is such an important event for every individual who will be there. And not only for them, but for their families. We need to do something special to honor that, to celebrate that. And of course, Miss Peggy Shivers came to mind. I honestly did not think that she would make that happen on such a short notice, but she did it. She made that happen. She was there. She welcomed them and she celebrated all new Americans with all of us. So, and I truly believe that best friend award, you deserved it and you've been doing it for so many years. And I thank you on behalf of Pike State Library District Board of Trustees, leadership and all staff for making such a difference in our community and of course in Pike State Library District. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Jim Scheletti, President Emeritus of the Friends, and former Pikes Peak Poet Laureate will be joining me in the award presentation. Our Best Friends Award. This year, the Friends of the Pikes Peak Library District introduce an award that recognizes an individual who has embodied the mission of the Friends over many years. The inaugural recipient of the Best Friend Award is Ms. Peggy Shivers. As John Spears, former chief librarian, stated in his tribute to you, you embody everything that a library stands for. We recognize Ms. Shivers for her extraordinary contribution to the Pikes Peak Library District and her ceaseless service to the Colorado Springs community. Jim Shaletti will share some of Peggy's story and the impact she has had on the community. As I begin to honor Peggy, in the words of Bertie Miller, Peggy is a legend in this town. Yeah. And I'm sure that her family and many friends here would be able to add to that. That's the first high note takeaway for this soprano, who we call Peggy Shiller's best friend. I'll give you a couple other takeaways before um, I get it. Uh, I'm okay. Um, let's listen to Peggy. Instead of me talking and narrating, I'm going to say Peggy's words that she shared with me the other day. For those of you that are way in the back, <laughs> Peggy is right here. 
<laughs> and I'm going to sit down as I share these words, and the reader will be right here with me. First, Peggy. I was born near Pittsburgh, Texas. And after my parents divorced, I lived with my grandmother. Every evening, my grandmother in her rocking chair and me on the floor taught me everything. She taught me so well that I skipped first grade and started school in the second grade. At age six, I began singing, and I loved it. At age seven, Peggy was moved to Portland, Oregon, where she grew up the rest of her youth. And I was singing there, maybe five or ten dollars a pop for this or that event. And in college there, we had a college touring company. I sang soprano, and Lawrence Layton Smith was my pianist. Some of you will remember Lawrence Layton Smith eventually wound up here with Peggy in Colorado Springs as Lawrence Layton Smith was the conductor of our symphony. As Peggy circled the globe, she landed in Madrid and, married, and was married to husband, the wonderful artist, Clarence Schirmer. And from 1969 to 1979, I sang and took care of the business and Clarence did his artwork. The people of Madrid loved us, a wonderful time there. And when I was sitting with uh, Peggy before lunch, she said, Franco was still in power. And so when she sang on the radio, it was broadcast over the entire country of Spain. So she's a legend in Spain as well as a legend here. Here's how Peggy and Clarence ended up in Colorado Springs. In 1979, while in Spain, Clarence was one of the Tuskegee Airmen and wanted to go to California for a Tuskegee Airmen reunion. Peggy said, Clarence was a car nut and bought a Datsun B210. And driving back from California, stopped in Colorado Springs. His friends got a realtor to show Clarence a model home up on Union Boulevard. And Clarence fell in love with it and bought a similar house on Purgatory Street. He called me and said, we're moving. I bought a house in Colorado Springs. Long story short, she said, because we were moving, Clarence had a big art show. And people were buying because they knew Clarence, knew Clarence was leaving. They bought two or three works of art. And as a result, she said, we made so much money, we were able to pay for that house. And we had a lot of money left over. And what did she do with that money left over? She started donating money to the Pikes Peak Library. Why? Because when Clarence started doing research and wanted to know about black authors and artists, there were very few or no books in the library. And that's why and how their generosity, doing the moral good for the community, provided the uh, Shivers Fund for the books, and that has brought about a collection of more than 2,000 books by black artists and writers and others. And I think we should have a great hand. And I have to think for a second. Uh, this, this is part of the takeaway. But after that, there was still uh, money left in the fund. And Peggy discovered that no one was helping young African-American musicians to learn about classical music and to perform in classical mu music. And so that's when they began and extended the fund, not just for books, but the Shiver Fund for promoting and nurturing African-American artists 
even with workshops for others to attend. And that still continues. And there's the concert and uh, series that are at Thanksgiving every year. And we ask you and I urge you to support the Shivers Fund through the Pikes Peak Library District. Peggy, when I was visiting with her on Wednesday, she said, I don't need any more recognition. And I said, Peggy, it's not about recognition. We're not giving you the Best Friend Award to recognize you. We're giving you the Best Friend Award because you, through your generosity, your philanthropy, your dedication to the cultural resources and the need for cultural resources in our community, you, the second takeaway, is the power of your example. We are honoring you today because you're just a wonderful person. You're delightful to be with, but it's the power of your example. And I share that with you because there are many friends here in this place, in this uh, luncheon today, who through your power and through your example have extended and developed the cultural resources of the Pikes, Le Pikes Peak Library District. And you all should be giving yourselves a hand for that as well. And the third takeaway to get today, the first one is she's a legend, the second is she uses the power of her example, and the third one is Peggy is delightful to be with, inspiring to talk with and to learn from, and most of all, Peggy, we love you. We dearly love you. Thank you all for your patience and letting me uh, sit by this wonderful lady, someone that we know and love very much. And Peggy, would you like to say a word or two? Okay. I'm not much for public speaking, but I just have to say thank you to the friends. I greatly appreciate this honor, but to tell the truth, I haven't done anything. <laughs> 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 It's just natural what has been done. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank um, friends that are here today. I really appreciate. Some of you I haven't seen in a long time. And we have some of the, by the way, the things that I've done, I haven't done by myself. We have people who help. We've got some of my committee members here. There are two here, Sharon and and I want to thank them publicly too. And it's the best committee. I mean, I have, and I have two that have been with me for the whole entire thir 30 years. So I want to thank each of you too. Thank you so much. And then I see a table back there. There's my ch church, my pastor, and some members of my church. I appreciate you being here. There's a table over there of Tuskegee Airmen people. Thank you so much for coming. Thank everybody for coming and thank you so much for this award. So Peggy, we are honored to present the inaugural Best Friend Award to you. I also have uh, John Spears sent uh, the tribute to you, so uh, I, I provide that to you. And then we have a certificate, like an award, a certificate. So the Breast Friend Award is presented to the Friends of the Pikes Peak Library District to Peggy Shivers in appreciation of your foresight, dedication, and contributions to the Pikes Peak Library District 1993 to 2020. 30 years. Yeah. The Golden Quill Award was established in 2004 to acknowledge exemplary literary or artistic achievement by a local author, artist, or photographer who is also involved in the community through workshops, teaching, or participating in literary or artistic events. Barbara Nicholas is a Wall Street Journal best-selling author 
an award-winning author of the Sidney Parnell series and the Dr. Evan Wilding series. I recently read the first book in Barbara Nicholas's Sidney Parnell series, Blood on the Tracks, featuring a railway cop and her canine partner. Whether you are a fan of crime mysteries and thrillers or not, you will fall in love with this character, get spellbound by the story, and understand why the book won so many awards. Barbara, could you please yeah. come up here for the presentation of your award? As we continue with this, I have a few words to say about uh, Barbara. Uh, Mary, I think I left a couple of my pages down there on the table. <laughs> this is normal for me, and while Mary brings up my words about Barbara, uh, you know, I believe in not eating before I speak because I get too nervous. And suddenly I sat down at my table and I saw a piece of cake. <laughs> there is a sign in my office, dessert first. <laughs> so you will notice on my table over there, I have a half of my cake eaten. And if any of you showed up at your table and there was no dessert there, it's my fault. <laughs> Good afternoon and I thank you for your generous support of the friends and these awards. Barbara Nicholas, from American military parents, was born in Guam, and after worldwide travels, Barbara landed here for our benefit in Colorado Springs. My wife, Mary, reminded me that Hooked on Books and Mary are the connection way back when Barbara was an avid book collector and reader and was haunting the shelves at Hooked on Books. Barbara has won two Colorado Book Awards and another Colorado Literary Awards and has garnished great praise for her six novels. I repeat, six novels. Once she said, oh, this is mine, forgive me. <laughs> Once I started reading her first book, Blood on the Tracks, I was hooked and stayed up night after night. Great writing, great storytelling, and when I finished the last page, like a great dessert, I wanted more. I opened the book and began reading it again. From her childhood years, Barbara knew and wanted to be a writer. Her writing journey now brings us to celebrate her for excellent, award-winning writing, honoring our community with her presence, and pleasing thousands of readers. Barbara Nicholas, we are honored and proud to present the Golden Quill Award to you. certificate for Barbara, the Friends of the Pikes Peak Library District presents the 2023 Golden Quill Award to Barbara Nicholas for outstanding literary achievement and she also received a $500 gift. I am so honored to be here. I thank you to the Friends of the Pikes Peak Library, thank you to all the committee members, thank you to the board members. Um, I just couldn't be more thrilled. And I want to say thanks to my friends and my family and my amazing data leaders who've been with me on this journey. So Linda asked if I would speak for five or six minutes, and I wrote a little speech, and last night I went to time it, and it was a minute and a half. <laughs> so we've got something fresh off the press, folks. <laughs> but it was easy because what I want to talk about today is the role that Pikes Peak, the Pikes Peak Library District played in my life as a reader and as a writer, because we have a little bit of a history. So um, I grew up in a family where we didn't have a lot of money, but books were a priority. And so discretionary spending went for books. But we didn't have a lot of that. 
And my allowance went to buy notebook paper and, and a little folder to keep the stories that I was just starting to write. Um, we did our best, but then the most amazing thing happened. Around the time I turned eight, this 28-foot blue and white bus <laughs> showed up within walking distance of our house. The um, Colorist Rooms Public Library, which was what PPLD was known as back then, had decided to add my neighborhood of Rustic Hills to their route. My mom, as a former English teacher, would take me there every week. I was allowed to check out whatever I wanted because my mom believed that if a child was interested in something, she should be able to read a book about it. She would be horrified by all the books that are being banned now. <laughs> Although I have to say, when Jobs came out in 1974, she said, you, you cannot read that. <laughs> <laughs> so what did I do? Oh, I still get a copy. Of course, it was the first book I would get to read. <laughs> but I can still see and smell and imagine that incredible blue and white bus. There were two doors, one on each end, and the steps that led into that magic portal that led to new worlds. I remember the tall shelves packed with books and then the linoleum floor that was always wet or dusty with children's footprints. I remember the librarian's desk crammed into the corner and the kindly old librarian who was always so helpful. You know, she was probably 30. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember especially this little footstool where I would just plot myself, and I would swim along the shelves, and I picked up Island of the Blue Dolphins, The Wolves of Willoughby Chase, all of the Encyclopedia Brown books. For me, the bookmobile was magic on wheels. And it was also where I learned that there were people out in the world that wrote these stories. You could write stories. So also when I was very little, I learned an important lesson, and that is that books can save us when life gets hard. And I learned this of all people from my dental hygienist. <laughs> I went in there as a little kid, I was very nervous, and I brought my book to read, which I still do to this day, wherever I go. And we bonded over these books about dogs and wolves. It turned out she had had a very hard childhood, and she used to sneak out her window at night go to the library, check out books, bring them back, and hide them under her bed. And so we started talking about Lad, a dog, and Old Yeller, and the White King, and Call of the Wild, and suddenly I wasn't scared of the dentist anymore. You know, Richard Rousseau said that the purpose of writing is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> Wise words, and that's what those books did for us. Um, I think that's one reason that experience with her and those books is one reason when I wrote my, my Sydney Parnell books, I decided she should have a canine partner. Because books and dogs, and books with dogs, are so comforting. So thank you, Pikes Peak Library District, for giving me access, early access, to great books that helped me start on my writing path. You are responsible for unleashing my literary self on the world. I bear no responsibility. <laughs> and no one would be happier than my mom that I'm receiving this award. No one would be more honored than she was. So this is for you, Mom. Thank you. Frank Waters, let me ask you all a question. How many of you have read a book by Frank Waters? This is good. This is the beginning. How many of you are going to read a book? <laughs> I hope so. Because Frank Waters, nominated for the Nobel Prize, born here in Colorado Springs, and had lived in Taos, New Mexico, till his passing in 1995, is a great writer. He wrote more than 20 books, excellent writing, and in 1993, the Friends began the Frank Waters Award by presenting the first 
Frank Waters the word to Frank Waters. <laughs> The Frank Waters Award, I need some assistance here. Time is short, they said. Stay on script. <laughs> I said, this is not a golf and go event. Relax, sit back, enjoy. The Frank Waters Award has annually, since 1993, and honoring outstanding writers whose lifetime writing achievements and the canon of their work reflects the themes, the content, and the values of the writings of Frank Waters, especially the peoples, their history and religion, the landscape, environment, cultures, even the mythology of the West and Southwest. To refresh our celebration and appreciation of Frank Waters, we remember that Frank was born here, and you can go see the house at 365 East Bijou. And across the street from that house is a beautiful small green park called Frank Waters Park. It's a great place to take one of Frank's books and sit there and sit on the grass or the bench and read one of his books. Frank wrote more than 20 books and was nominated for the Nobel Prize. My wife's favorite is Midas of the Rockies. How many of you know about Stratton? And the money that he donated for the Stratton home for boys, and I believe girls, who did not have parents and needed a family, so to speak. Anyhow, Midas of the Rockies is about Stratton. It's about, and Stratton was so dedicated, he was very wealthy after Cripple Creek. He bought bicycles. He bought bicycles for the women who were doing the laundry and carrying laundry to the different homes and establishments in this community. Um, my favorite is The Man Who Killed the Deer. The Man Who Killed the Deer was praised in the Saturday Review as the most beautiful book and by far the finest novel of American Indian life. The Man Who Killed the Deer has been continually in print since it arrived in 1948. And of course we have copies here with us today. All of Frank's books have been in print continually since 19. 95. I know time is short, but this is not a golf and go event, so I'm going to read to you a passage. One of my favorite passages. This book is so important to me that I think I have red ink on the lining almost every page. Anyhow, um, Martiniano is saying to his son, his son is 12, his son has to go into Kiva and learn it and leave his mother in the ways of the mother, so to speak, and cut the umbilical cord from the mother and, and go into manhood. And, and this passage here is uh, one of my favorite. He says, Hush, son, you are in the womb of our mother earth. You will be here many, many months. A long, long time. You have entered a child, you will be reborn from here a man. Then you will know why it is you must stay. Let there be no more whimpering, no more questions, son. You are in a womb. A womb. In it, the eyes, the ears, the nose, and babbling mouth do not function. The knowledge that will come to you is the intuitive truth of the spirit, the quintessent wisdom of the blood, transmitted through senses you do not use outside. The pulse of the earth throbs through these walls, which enclose you. The embers there reflect the heat of its glowing heart. That little hole runs through the center of the world into the lake of life itself. Remember, you are the womb, child. Then it goes on, 
very quickly to the final. And he said, you have learned what in your ordinary animal existence is necessary for your earthly body, as we have right here our eating for our earthly body. Now you must have awakened in you the instinctive need for self-perfection in your innermost spiritual being. You have recognized the need for your innermost spiritual being. Literature, books, the wisdom of many. You must be taught the laws of the world creation and world maintenance, the laws of all life, whatever form it takes, the living stones, the breathing mountains, the tall walking rain, as well as those of bird and fish, beast and man. You must learn that each man has the debt of his arising and his individuality of existence to pay. That this debt must be discharged as early and quickly as possible so that you, as I, as all, may assist in turn the most rapid perfecting of other beings, the most rapid perfecting of other beings, as Peggy <laughs> and Clarence have done with their great donation for books to nurture the culture of African American writers and artists. Learn so that you, as I, as all, may assist in turn the most rapid perfecting of other beings. Those like ourselves and those units of life advance to the degree of self-individuality. Kathleen and Michael Gear, know that you are in the company of 20 Frank Waters awardees, including Tony Hillerman and Scott Mamaday, Nancy Wood, and John Nichols. And now Rita will help with the presentation of the award. I think I have a stick here somewhere. Michael Gear and Kathleen O'Neill Gear are New York Times best-selling authors and award-winning archaeologists who have written well over 60 books, separately and together. They write across several literary categories, historical fiction, science fiction, historical nonfiction, thrillers, and young adult, to just name a few. They have used their archaeological expertise of ancient people to create novels that blend Udon suspense, compelling characters, historical romance, and a wealth of archaeological and anthropological information. So one of the things you sort of might have picked it up when I mentioned Barbara's book is, you know, for many years, I've been coming to this literary awards event. And you know, in most cases, I hadn't read the authors who we were honored. And so I would listen to them speak, and I got excited, and then I'd go and read their book. Well, this year I said, I'm going to do something different. I'm actually going to read their books before the award ceremony. So, so in preparation, I read People of the Long House. Oh my gosh. You know, I actually had thought that I would not enjoy or, you know, just who knows what. But what an extraordinary book. I was drawn in by the culture of the ancient people, by the mystery of the story, and then the cliffhanger ending, which of course means I am now reading the next novel in that series. I mean, I could have stopped, but it's like, no, what happened? I mean, I really need to know what happened. So Michael and Kathleen, could you please join us? for the presentation of the
So I was joking with them that the check is in Kathleen's certificate. $1,000 check. The Frank Waters Award is presented by the Friends of the Pikes Peak Library District to W. Michael Gear, Kathleen O'Neill Gear, for a body of work representing excellence in writing and storytelling that embodies the spirit of the American West. Thank you, Rita and Jim and friends of the library. I can't tell you what a huge honor it is for us to receive an award with Frank Waters' name on it. Mike put it very well when we were when Linda Duval called us to say that we had won an award. Mike said, Do you know who's won that award? And I said, Well, yeah, I know several people. He said, It's a little like walking with the gods. <laughs> I'm intimidated and very humbly. Thank you so much for this award. Today we want to talk a little bit about how we uh, started writing, how we write our books together, because people ask us that very often, and talk about how we use the uh, archaeological data in our books to bring the characters and the stories to life. So Mike, you want to talk about how you got started writing first? Okay, I, I, like Frank Waters, I was born in Colorado Springs. Unlike Frank Waters, my house was torn down long ago with St. Francis Hospital. <laughs> so, therefore, I took this as, as a sign when I was two years old that I was probably unwanted here and left. And I'm glad to find out after all these years I was wrong. <laughs> okay, to start with, uh, I was doing archaeology in Wyoming it, as a graduate student at Colorado State University. My specialty was actually in, in physical anthropology. And being a graduate student, I was deeply in debt. And I was informed, looking for a summer job, well, Western Wyoming College in Rock Springs is hiring archaeologists for $4.40 an hour. In 1978, that was all the money in the world. So I loaded up my little Shelby dog, because as we know, all good stories have dogs in them. <laughs> And the thing about doing archaeology in <clears throat> Wyoming is we used to get the Thanksgiving blizzard. And after that, the whole state freezes up. And even if you knew where the archaeology was, you can't dig it. So I retreated to the family cabin up on Bertha Pass, two miles west of Empire. Had a wood stove and a two-hole outhouse, and it did have electricity. And in the process, I was reading this Western novel. Now, in the novel, our protagonist takes off from Texas with a herd of steers. Key word, steers. Okay? Now, when I tell the story in New York, nobody gets it. <laughs> in the epilogue of the book, our hero is in the Gallatin Valley in Montana, and his steers are calving. <laughs> hey, got it. All right, for, for, the, our, for those of you who did move here recently from New York City, the steer is, is, a, is a surgically uh, corrected male. <laughs> there, there's a nice Latin word, we won't use that. Okay, but in the, so I took this book and I threw it across the cabin and I said, Bye. God, I can do better than that. <laughs> You'll notice I don't have a very high bar. <laughs> okay, so I sat down, and the, the, the little voice always sits there, and any of you who are aspiring writers, don't believe the little voice. Because the little voice said, you rip your hair out doing an 80-page archaeological report, how are you going to write a novel? <laughs> Well, I'd also been trying to teach myself to play the violin. It was going nowhere. And the pack rat moved out of the woodshed in December. So I sat down the next morning with the typewriter, which shows you how long ago this was. And in two and a half weeks, I had done a 550-page Western novel. They look impressed. <laughs> 
<laughs> and if there is justice in the universe, you will not. <laughs> because it was wretched. <laughs> so here's the key. Is even though it had large didactic passages on, on Mount Shoshone culture and, and dialogue that was so scintillating, it was he said, she said, he said, she said, he said, she said. The, the fact is, is I fell in love with the process of telling the story. I mean, I fell in love with the girl. <laughs> yeah, I hoorahed the good guy, I hissed and spit and then cussed at the bad guy. But the important thing is, is that the magic was there. The spark was lit and the dream was born. So, I met Mike in 1981 at a Wyoming Association of Professional Archaeologists meeting. And my boss had recently returned from the Plains Anthropological Conference where he said, I met the neatest guy. This guy does field work all year long, and then in the wintertime, when you can't do field work in Wyoming and Colorado, he goes to a cabin in the mountains in, in, outside of Empire, Colorado, and writes novels. And he said, Kathy, I know you've always wanted to write a novel, and this is a cool guy. So we get to the Wyoming Association of Professional Archaeologists meeting, and we walk into the room, and Ray says to me, Kathy, this is the guy I was telling you about. This is, you know, my gear. And I looked him over, and my first words to Mike were, did you sleep in that sweater? <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, no. I slept on the sweater, wired up, she uses a pillow. And I said, oh, that's really different. <laughs> and so a little while later, we went out to lunch, and I was sitting, I was, they, Mike was already seated, he and his boss were, and so my boss and I went there, and I pulled out my chair, and when I stepped down, I stepped into something really squishy. And I looked at Mike and I said, you threw your hat on the floor? And he said, there's no hat crack. Of course I did. And I thought, well, this is a... <laughs> I was raised as a traditional Colorado kid. And if you wore your hat, there were rules. You could wear your hat in a lobby. You could wear your hat in a pin, but once you stepped into a restaurant or into an office, you took your hat off. And if you didn't, my mother would hit you in the head with something very, very hard. In the head. <laughs> so I thought, you know, this is a little bit like throwing your hat on the floor of a taxi cab, very dangerous in the restaurant. But I thought, you know, I really. It was a field hat. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I really should at least pick this up and wipe off my boot print. And I reached in to pick up his hat and it was stuck to the floor. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I, I looked at him and I sat down and we had this lovely, you know, lunch together. And I was so impressed by him that about a week later we went out to uh, dinner on our first day. And we're sitting out having pizza. And I said to him, we were talking about archaeology, and I said, you know, I have Cherokee ancestors. And Mike looks at me with this weird glow in his eyes, leans across the table and says, can I stick my finger in your mouth? <laughs> now, I've heard some lines before, <laughs> but that was really unique. And I said, okay, stick your finger in my mouth. So what he does is he sticks his finger in my mouth to feel the backs of my two front teeth to see if I have shovel-shaped incisors, which is a classic characteristic of Native people. And I, of course I do. And he looked at me and he said, oh, he said, you really do have Native ancestors. And I said, well, yeah, I do. And so Mike and I decided a few weeks later that we would, well, a few months later, actually, that we would get married. And he said to me, so what do you plan to do with the rest of your life? And I said, well, you know, someday I'd like to write a novel. And I said, but it takes me forever to write an archaeological report. So it's going to take me years to write a novel. And he looked at me and said, no, it won't. Two weeks. <laughs> and I said, I'd really like to see this novel that you wrote in two weeks. And the next thing I know is the UPS truck arrives and delivers stacks of manuscripts. These are books that he's already written after he wrote the one about this, you know, not cabin steers. And 
I looked at them when I read them, and they were absolutely dreadful. <laughs> but his character stood up on the page, stared you in the eye, and talked directly to you. And I said, but my parents were both writers. My mother was a newspaper journalist. My father wrote short stories. And I said, this guy really has talent, even if you know the craft isn't quite there yet. And so Mike decided that he was going to sell his archaeological company, and I would work for a year longer for the federal government, you know, keep the bills paid. And then I would quit and we'd start writing books. In that year where I was still working, and Mike was writing novels, all of my colleagues at the BLM would walk up to me on occasion and say, so, has your deadbeat husband sold any books yet? <laughs> and I would always say, no, but he will. Yeah. About a year after I started writing books, we had retired to a cabin in Colorado, which had no running water. It was built in 1859. And it was interesting. It had, thank goodness it had uh, you know, the rural electrification project in the 1950s that brought electricity so we could write. But after about a year, we were down to $147.84 in the bank. And we looked at each other and said, you know, this may not work because we've got to have money. And just at that time, a friend of ours in Utah was working on an archaeological project and called us and said, I really need field crew. Can you guys come and work? And we said, yeah, you know, we can come and work. Absolutely. It was winter. It was freaking freezing. But nonetheless, we made enough money to survive and got back from the archaeological project. And a month later, Mike sold four books in three days to two different publishers. And later on that year, I sold two books, and we were off and running. Let's talk a little bit about how we write books together. Yeah, this, this was a, an interesting time, because coming back from doing, we did the I-70 expansion project across the San Rafael Swell for uh, for Bill Davis at Abajo Archaeology, yeah, God bless Bill. And an editor that we had met at the Western Writers had called us up and said, hey, I've been trying to get a hold of you. You know, where have you been? He said, oh, God, we found this great project. We found the oldest pit house in, in Utah, dates to about 6,000 years ago, and you know, these phenomenal Fremont caches that still had the, the, the shells from the pine nuts in them. And got a couple of other, you know, found up a whole bunch of the, the gaming stones. And he said, why aren't you writing this? And I told him, I said, well, if the lady that said that she might agent my stuff said that no one would read about American archaeology. That if we were going to write Europe, she'd sell our stuff. But no one would buy books about North America's cultural heritage. And he said, all my life. And he says, here's what I want. He says, I want a big hefty book that I can put in my hefty bag and walk the hefty streets of Manhattan with. <laughs> okay? And he says, what I want to see happen in this book is I want to see the people coming across the, the, the Bering Sea, coming into North America, and then each of the, the, the characters splits off to become the founder of one of the major linguistic families in North America. So I kind of looked at Kathy, and I said, OK, Mike, let, let me get this straight. You want us to do like 15,000 years of cultural heritage covering an entire continent that is going to create the origin of 284 separate language families. And in one book, and I said, you write us the check? We'll write it for you. <laughs> of course, it'll have a plot like the phone book, but I mean, after all, I've written my first novel and we already know it's stuck, so who can you care? But anyway, that was the origins for the People series. And originally, he said, okay, what do you need? He said, well, coming close to covering the incredible complexity of North American archaeology and the, the, the brilliance of the cultures that lived here and the, the richness of the cultural tapestries that we're dealing with. I mean, we could barely scratch the surface with six books. So they gave us that original six book contract. And 
and we were off and running. Do we ever argue about what we're writing about? Uh, no, we don't. <laughs> the, the first time we started co-authoring was with People of the Wolf, and I had created this stately tribal elder named Broken Branch, and I handed the chapter to Mike, who was going to rewrite it, add things, change things. And when he handed it back, I said, you turned my stately tribal elder into a folksy old crumb? <laughs> and Mike said, no, I didn't. Let me read this dialogue to you. And so he reads my dialogue in an entirely different voice. And I went, ah, I just learned something about how to write dialogue, right? So we were teaching each other with every single sentence that we were writing. And Mike and I, when we were co-authoring, we will hand the book back and forth a dozen times, rewriting each other's writing, so that we're adding descriptions and expanding on the dialogue, uh, trying to create better action sequences. But we rewrite each other's writing all the time. Mike and I have been to signings where people will show up with one of our books, and they're heavily underlined in blue and pink. And they will say to us, well, I've got this figured out. Kathy wrote everything in pink, and my wrote everything in blue. Now, do you notice something sexist about this yeah. to start with? And Mike and I always say, that's amazing you could figure that out. We do not add it because we can't. Because by the time we're finished, I can't say I wrote that. Because we have written that. Okay. Listen. I love the lady. But, and this all sounds really good. Let's get right down to the truth, okay? And I'll tell you how this works. How many of you guys out there have read our stuff? Hands up. Okay. Now, here's the thing. For those of you who have read our stuff, all of the parts that you... And for those of you who will read our stuff, all of the parts that you really, really, really like, that you think is, uh, is, is exquisite writing, that's perceptive, she wrote that. <laughs> now, anything that you think's a little bit clunky? <laughs> Not exactly accurate. What Mike and I do is we have different expertises in the fields of history and archaeology. And so whoever's expertise we're writing about drafts out the bare bones of the plot and the characters. And then we end up handing the book back and forth, rewriting each other's writing. So, it is truly a collaborative effort. But we have argued substantially for periods of like three weeks at a time over the tiniest archaeological details. We don't usually argue about the writing, because if I write something and Mike has a problem with it, somebody out there is going to have a problem with it, and so it needs to be rewritten. Yeah, I mean, but guys, we do argue about the archaeology. I have written stuff that was so profound <laughs> that it was going to rock the Pulitzer Committee back on its heels and redefine Western literature. <laughs> and Kathleen has handed it back to me with writing all over it that says, this is real fecal material. <laughs> okay, she used a different word, but you get, you get the point. <laughs> yes, we do that for each other routinely. <laughs> and Mike and I write a diversity of things. Uh, Rita was asking us at the table, so you write prehistory, you write historical fiction, you write science fiction. You know, how do you, how do, you do that? But the truth is that anthropology and archaeology are not just about the past. They're about the present and they're about the future. And we can use anthropological theory to project from current trends into the future what might happen. And that's why we do a lot of science fiction as well. Everything that we do is archaeology or anthropologically based. In, in, keep in mind that if people will ask us, especially about the people books, they'll say, okay, you're, you're, you're writing about uh, the fall of, of Chaco Canyon, or you're writing about Poverty Point, or in Louisiana, or like with the people of the Longhouse, uh, this, was, this is the first boy, book in the Iroquois Quartet, and this is about the founding of the League of the Iroquois. And this is really important for us as Americans because the concept of one person, one vote, European, 
<laughs> Referendum and recall? Is that a European idea? No. The idea of a confederacy, of a union of governments, like the League of the Iroquois, was that European? Not on your life. That all came from either the League of the Iroquois, from the Cherokee Confederacies, or from the Creek Confederacies in, in the far south. And you have this constant influence of the Enlightenment thinkers in the early 1700s that is all directly attributable to these Native American concepts of politics. So, I mean, we're writing about how the League of the Iroquois was founded, and in doing so, putting together all of, how do you put together this League? How do you create that, that understanding, which is what comes rolling out of, of the children being stolen in the book? But it's all about whether we're writing a, a Paleo-Indian book set in 15,000 years. It's all about touching that basic humanity because all of us are all just people. I mean, all eight billion of us, there is more genetic variation in a single band of West African ship disease than there is in all eight billion of us human beings on the planet. So we're all one. We, we do want to talk a little bit about censorship today. And that's been a very important issue for us, especially over the last two years where authors are facing some extreme kinds of censorship from New York publishers. And we know that libraries have also been assaulted by book bans. And it's been really intriguing for us to see the kinds of books that they're banning and what the New York publishers are telling us, we can no longer write. Yeah. Now, we're lucky because we've been hit hard from both sides. With the publication of People of the Wolf in 1990, a group in Michigan calling themselves the New Inquisition uh, sent us 160 death threats. Mm -hmm. they, I, I, spooky stuff, you know, where they, they would Xerox parts of the Bible and paste them on a page. And they're, what they were upset with us about is because we were writing about Native American culture and in Native American culture, it's, it's almost a North American universal, that people have animal spirit helpers to help guide you in, in your journey through life. And according to the New Inquisition, this was preaching Satanism and that we deserve to be killed and, and sent to judgment. We're in good company. Stephen King and Clyde Barker were on that list. But it, it's still one of those things that had, had a, a profound impact on our on our lives as writer, we, we moved to a ranch on the end of a dead end road so that nobody could find us. But then just recently, uh, I did a book called The Alpha Enigma, which now, Kathy and I write some pretty tough stuff. I mean, you're reading people at the Longhouse that this is about children being, native children being stolen and sold in. It, and it's, it's uh, a portrait of a period of warfare where the Iroquois say they almost destroyed themselves. It's very violent warfare. Okay, so we write stories. <laughs> 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 All right, who brought the pistol? <laughs> 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 that was about uh, a group of people in a military psychiatric hospital who use their, their debilities to overcome them and solve the problem and save the world. I mean, it's, it's nice. It, it's, it's, a, it's a diverse cast of people dealing with all of this. And of course, we have a, a little bit of time travel thrown in because theoretical physics is one of those things we absolutely love. And the, my publisher bought it. Uh, Sheila Gilbert thought that this was, was just great, that the book needed to be written. 
And then we went through copy edit on it. Two months before pub, I get a three-page letter from Sheila saying, these are the comments that Penguin Random House have and things that they want changed for sensitivity in the book. Or else, or else, they will not market or sell or distribute your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, just for, for grins, guys, go to the Penguin Random House site and look at their statement on publishing and freedom of expression. And I want you to know it's for every author except their own. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, the, the hypocrisy on this is just huge. So for two months, Kathy and I, well, I spent the night walking the floor, and she spent the night worrying about me because we were researching attorneys in, in New York who had experience in litigation on First Amendment rights. And poor Sheila, I mean, Daw Books was an independent company inside Penguin Random House, and Sheila says, what are you going to do about this? And I said, well, we're going to go to court. And she says, well, yeah, but your contract is with us. They only do our distribution. And someone has to put a stop to this. One of the first things that the sensitivity reader complained about is, okay, go back to the setup. We're talking military psychiatric unit. Same here in Colorado Springs, by the way, just to bring it home to you. And one of the characters is both dissociative and schizophrenic. And Falcon, when he has problems he has to deal with, he uses his alternate dissociative personalities, one of whom is Major Marx, and he's like a, the, the standard, yeah, he's your, your, your just stereotype military officer, you know, steely hair, perfect uniform. And the other one is Teresa Applegate, who is his physicist in his head. And she's skinny and dresses like 1950. And he calls her a skinny, skinny witch. And the sensitivity readers said, this might be offensive to people with bulimia. <laughs> OK, now, that's weird enough, right? But keep in mind, they're not even real. They're hallucinations. <laughs> and you know, it, it's. It gets worse. I mean, mm -hmm. you, if you're describing the small hills that cover the landscape as looking like boils upon the land, the uh, sensitivity readers will say, you're going to offend someone with acne? Take it out. So you can't describe anything. Well, we, Mike and I write about a diversity of characters. And so, and you have to remind your reader through your books what people look like because you forgot, right? So you have to tell somebody that this character has blonde hair, or this is a black character, or this is a Hispanic character. And they said to us, okay, you've got this great black character. Now, you've described in the beginning, you've told your readers that this is a black character. You can never, ever discuss that again. My I said, wait a minute. Can we tell our readers that this character is blonde hair with blue eyes? And they said, oh yeah, we don't care about that. But you can't mention that this character is black more than once, because then you're making a thing of it. Mike and I said, so you know what the reader remembers at the end? Is all you blonde hair and blue eyed characters. That is defeating the entire purpose, folks. And it's, it's gotten really unpleasant. So the, the, the whole the way that this, this ended is, yeah, I'm threatening to go to court, and our publisher brokered a deal, deal with Penguin Random House, and Sheila said, how about if I give you some, some changes that you would make that would normally show up like in a copy edit, can we do that? And I said, yeah, that I can do. <coughs> but anything that goes specifically to character? Um, for example, um, Carl Raven is, is uh, she's a female SEAL who lost her platoon in Afghanistan. And she is there because of severe PTSD. And she's describing the fact that, that she got raped in the shower to her therapist, to, to Dr. Timothy Ryan. And this is, is marked off and said, we can't have this. 
Now, your obvious thought is it's going to have to do because it deals with the rate, right? No. At the bottom, it's, at the bottom it says, describes retribution. Because Carla gets back at the men who raped her, <coughs> and you can talk about rape. You cannot talk about revenge. Folks, do you know what the major plot of literary traditions have been for thousands of years? It's revenge. So it's, it's interesting. God bless the libraries, and I hope that you just continue to stand up, because all books should at least be there. Because without them, how do we develop critical thinking? about how to look at other perspectives and how to learn and how to evaluate because we have some real serious problems and if we do not think if we do not think rationally if we do not investigate i mean we're screwed just in closing <coughs> libraries are guardians of freedom of expression and ideas Thank you all very much.